Before we get started, there will be major spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War Arc of Bleach in this video to follow. Despite being arguably the two biggest and greatest villains of Bleach, certainly the villains with the largest impact series-wide, Yu Harbach differs from Aizen in many ways, from his no-nonsense, all-conquering, warlord approach to the truly godlike reverence his army actually has for him, and even his own willingness to step foot on the battlefield himself and get his hands dirty. Those differences also extend to their respective villainous schemes, and specifically Yuhabark's motivation for what he's trying to do. While at times their initial goals may seem similar, their reasoning behind what they want to achieve is vastly different. Aizen wanted to destabilize and replace a governing body that he felt was an abomination, and he despised the thought of anyone, particularly something like the current iteration of the Soul King, ruling over him. Yuhabak has, after a few additional steps, a similar scheme to remove the current Soul King from power, but for another reason entirely, and with a considerably different and in many ways worse outcome for everyone involved. As the supreme villain of the final arc of Bleach, it's fitting that Yu Harbach's endgame then not only involves all worlds, therefore bringing all these lands and races together, uniting them in their desire to stop him, but also threatens the very way of life in the Bleach universe. In this video, we'll take a look at Yuhabark's motivation. What does the Quincy King actually want? What does he hope to achieve by launching this all-out war, not just on the Soul Society, but on the many worlds of Bleach itself? Let's take a look, because if anything, Yuhabark's motivation is both more complicated and obfuscated than Aizen's own. Before we get started on the video, guys, if you haven't hit subscribe yet, make sure to do that now for more Bleach content like this every single week. And if you enjoyed the video, make sure to give it a thumbs up as well to help support the channel. And if you want to take that support for me another step further, I do have a Patreon as well. And as always, I want to say a massive shout out and give a huge everlasting thank you to everyone supporting me over there on Patreon. I really do appreciate it. And if you want to support me in an even easier way, make sure to go and check out my second channel, Mr. Tomo Talks Games. Again, I really do appreciate all of the support over there, taking that Bloodborne retrospective and just smashing all of my expectations with it, which I am so very grateful for. But no matter how you choose to support me, whatever form it takes, just know that I really do appreciate each and every one of you. And once again, to reiterate, there will be some pretty major spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War in this video to come. There's an interesting irony to this comparison between Yuhabak and Aizen. I'd argue that Aizen is the more complex character with the more straightforward general goal and motive, while Yuhabak is the total opposite. As you might expect from the villain of an arc called the Thousand Year Blood War, Yuhabak's motivation and his desire is rooted in the past. He's waging war now in the present day, not just against the worlds of Bleach, but the current status quo, the way the world of Bleach has become. He wants to tear it all down. And now let's break it down, starting with a top-down, high-level look at what the Quincy King is actually after, starting with his ultimate goal. Yuhabak wants to return all the worlds of Bleach to their original primordial state. Unfortunately, this aspect of Yuhabak's motivation, essentially its entire core, is criminally understated in the source material, with much of its grand designs coming from the light novel Can't Fear Your Own World. In that vein, then, it's revealed in Can't Fear Your Own World that millions of years ago, eons ago, at the very start, essentially, of the Bleach universe, the history of Bleach as we know it, the universe of Bleach was one tangled mess of existence. There was no cycle of life and death, the cycle that's so important to the current way of things. Instead, everyone and everything just existed in constant suspension, I guess, with those very early primordial humans helpless, being constantly hunted by the hollows that also existed alongside them. Despite this being Yuhabak's ultimate end goal, 
this part of his motivation has always been the toughest for me to reconcile with personally. We knew for the vast majority of the arc, or at least the latter two-thirds, that the Quincy King wanted to destroy all three worlds, but we never knew why. Askin Naklavar teases that Yuhabark wanted to create something new from this devastation, but didn't expand on what that new world might actually be, because presumably he didn't really know either. I personally always thought that Yuhabark planned on rebuilding his Quincy nation from the ashes of the three destroyed worlds, but that doesn't seem to be the case either. Instead, the Quincy King simply wanted to return the universe of Bleach to its earliest primordial state, a world without death, where its people can supposedly live without fear. The problem with this is this is only revealed in the very last chapter of the series, chapter 686. And so with very little information and knowledge to go on, this begs the question, why did Yu Habak want this? I think personally there's maybe two different answers, both of which are deeply personal to Yu Habak himself. The first is that Yu Habak's own existence is very peculiar and very unique within the world of Bleach. He exists at all times terrified of reverting back to a state of essentially suspended animation. Not quite death, but for all intents and purposes a death-like state. As explained to us in chapter 565, one of the few chapters that really dives into some exposition surrounding Yuhabark himself, God Like You, Hashwolf states that fighting and war is how Yuhabark continues to live. Without it, without absorbing souls upon the deaths of those Yuhabark has touched with his power, he'll eventually revert back to this state of being blind, deaf, mute, and unable to physically move at all. Which, from this flashback of his, is how we can assume he actually came into being. He came into this world in this terrifying state. So, I guess Yuhabark has this fear hanging over him constantly, and I wonder if he wanted to remove the constant fear of death from humanity as a means of freeing them from what he believes is the ultimate eternal curse, something that plagues him constantly, and I guess he feels is always hanging over his shoulder. He wanted to remove that same burden for those I guess he would have believed to have been his subjects. My other theory is that he wants to make all worlds one again in honour of his father, the Soul King. As we also found out in Can't Fear Your Own World, it was the Soul King's power of the Almighty which was stolen and bastardised by the same nobles that imprisoned the Soul King himself, which split the world in the first place. Perhaps by restoring it to the way it once was, Yuhabark thinks he's doing what his father would have wanted. Speaking of the Soul King, he plays an important role in Yuhabark's motivations. In order to begin the collapse of the world, Yuhabark needs to do the same as what Aizen wanted to do. He needs to first kill the Soul King. Something the Soul King almost certainly foresaw with his absolute version of the Almighty. But this isn't the only reason Yuhabark wants to kill his father. Unlike Aizen, who sees the desiccated remains of the Soul King as an insult, only referring to him as a thing with disdain and instead wanting to supplant him and take his place upon that throne, Yuhabark harbours no such ill will. In fact, it's the complete opposite. Yuhabark hopes that by killing his father, he'll free him from his endless humiliation that he's suffering at the hands of the Shinigami and their prison. So, as we can see, Yuhabak's ultimate end goal stems from his history, and a very personal drive to right the crimes committed by the Shinigami so many years ago. It's a shame that to truly understand his motivation, you need Can't Fear Your Own World, and this is one of the biggest things I hope the anime remedies. That being said, Yuhabark's motivation seems to be ever-changing, or at the very least he adapts his goals as he moves through the stages of his war. 
There's even more to what this man actually wants than just that. What we just described is very much the highest level of Yuhabark's goal, but he has more short-term plans too. When we first meet Yuhabark in chapter 484, he comes across as a warlord, essentially, who wants to invade the Soul Society. Even his subjugating of Waco Mundo is for that very purpose, and a lot of people, I think rightly, used to believe that Yuhabark's motivation was born out of a hatred for the Shinigami for the purge they committed 200 years ago. However, it was fairly quickly established that while Yuhabark himself doesn't seem to actually care about what happened 200 years ago, he does care about the defeat he personally suffered a thousand years ago, the very namesake of the Ark itself. A millennia ago, Yuhabark's goal was to conquer the entirety of the human world at the time, transforming it into his Quincy nation called the Licht Reich, or the Empire of Light. While we don't know the exact extent of his success back in the day, we do know that Yuhabark was successful in conquering at least an entire country known as the Northern Territories. However, Yuhabark himself secretly desired more than this. His ambition was so great. Even here, a thousand years ago, he sought vengeance on the Soul Society for what they had done to his father. He revealed to Zedritz, a high-ranking member of the Lichtreich at the time, that he planned on assaulting the Soul Society next, surprising Zedritz, who clearly had no idea about this goal, and Yuhabart claimed that he wanted to use a new combat unit to do so, called the Sternritter. Yuhabark fed lies to the populace of the Licht Reich to get them to believe in and bolster his war effort. Hubert told the people that Yuhabark believed the Soul Society to be a genuine threat to them, and if left unchecked, they would almost certainly attack themselves. Whether this is really true or not remains to be seen, but a dictator like Yuhabark spreading misinformation like this is absolutely not unheard of, and despite, of course, the fact that the current Gote 13 at this time period was a group of thuggish monsters, I see no reason to believe they would attack the human world unprovoked. Regardless, Yuhabark gathered his forces and launched his first invasion into the Soul Society. Despite the anime giving us a really fantastic new look at this battle, we still don't know the exact details behind Yuhabark's survival, but what we do know is that Yuhabark and the Lichtreich were completely decimated at the hands of the first Gote 13, forcing their total retreat. What was left of the Lichtreich and the Sternritter escaped into Soul Society's shadows, eventually transforming themselves into the Vandenreich over time, while Yuhabark regained his power over the next nine centuries. And so that brings us to the current day, where there definitely seems to be an element of revenge in Yuhabark's desire to crush the Soul Society, specifically its head, Yamamoto himself, belittling him and the way of life he now leads. But once he achieves this goal, he then moves on to his larger scale plan. And yet there seems to be an element of still doing things on the fly, which makes Yuhabark quite interesting. And even this, the first Quincy invasion, while it may seem like it's being led by a petty revenge, by Yuhabark wanting to get the last word on Yamamoto over their conflict that's lasted a thousand years, Doing so also kind of readies the Soul Society for the next bigger invasion, which would lead as a stepping stone to reach the Royal Palace. Although he does succeed in killing the Soul King and setting into motion the destruction of the Bleach universe, like I said, Yuhabak currently holds no ill will towards his father, instead thinking he's carrying out his wishes. And for the most part, he's probably not wrong, as you might expect from a being who was bound and dismembered purely because the nobility at the time feared his power and his intentions, the Soul King never stopped seeing the Shinigami as his true enemy clearly allowing them to bind him because he foresaw that millions of years into the future, his son would one day return and set things right. 
Not only that, but the Soul King's own overwhelming Reiatsu launches an attack on the Shinigami when set loose, bypassing the Quincy entirely. However, it's not as simple as that. The Soul King's body parts, which were separated from him a million years prior, have since gained sentience of their own, and agendas of their own as well. While the majority of the Soul King's body parts continue to see themselves as and identify as Quincy, one does not. Mimihagi, the right arm of the Soul King, has lived among the Shinigami for a million years at this point, and has now grown attached to them. When it rises up from Ukitake's body to stabilise the shattered corpse of the King, thereby halting Yuhabak's plans unexpectedly, Yuhabak realises the essence of his father still exists and is contained within that shadowy arm, due to not being able to foresee its actions with his own version of the Almighty, meaning this arm's power must be eclipsing his own. This causes Yuhabak to become enraged. How could even a portion of his father's will have grown to love the Shinigami that once imprisoned him? How could a piece of his father want to stand in his son's way after so many years? Everything Yuhabak has done up until this point has been in service of what he believed to be was carrying out his father's wishes and, as I said, freeing him from the pain of that unjust imprisonment. And so, when Ichigo and the others are defeated, leaving the right arm vulnerable, it launches a last-ditch attack at Yuhabak himself, not realising how different their strength actually is anymore. Seething with anger at his father's seeming abandonment of him, of his ideals, at this betrayal, Yuhabak decides in that moment to not only kill the Soul King as he had planned to do originally, but now also rob him of his own power, taking everything the Soul King once claimed to be his for himself. Out of spite, essentially, for the right arm's actions, Yuhabak saps it of whatever strength he can, transforming himself into essentially the new Soul King, though only able to contain a fraction of his father's true strength. And thus, with that, we return to Yuhabak still wanting to reshape the universe, though he now has even more power at his disposal. Admittedly, while this does all make sense on paper, what's a little strange about this, and what's always confused me, is that it definitely seems like he never planned to steal his father's power before, instead content to just watch the worlds collapse into one another, because... As far as Yuhabak was concerned, Mimihagi didn't exist or wasn't going to try and get in his way, so he would have never met the right arm to steal its power in the first place. But by stealing his father's power, Yuhabak was able to remodel the royal palace, turning it into Varvelt, his fortress which he considered to be the foundation of his new world. And so I suppose then that the major difference would have been Varvelt simply wouldn't have existed in this new primordial world Yuhabak wanted to create if the right arm of the Soul King had never appeared before him. And that's why it just seems a little bit weird to me, because upon creation of Varvelt, Yuhabak seems very proud with it. He seems to have always wanted something like this to call the foundation of their true world that they were about to create. So maybe he would have just made another fortress without his father's power, but it's made pretty clear by Kyoraku that the only reason this was possible, that remodeling, reshaping the royal palace into the imagery of the Vanden Reich, it's only possible because Yuhabak now stole his father's additional power, and Yuhabak himself even considers himself to now be overflowing with power, something he hadn't sensed or felt until that moment. But that's really it for everything regarding Yuhabak, the Quincy King's motivation, what he actually wants from this war that he's launching, that he's waging against the entirety of the Bleach universe. Let me know in the comments below if you found this video interesting or helpful or anything like that, and how you feel about Yuhabak's overall motivation, but also the way it seems to kind of change on the fly as the Thousand Year Blood War arc progresses. How do you feel about 
about it in comparison to the other main villain of the series, Aizen's motivation, his goal. Which one do you prefer? Which one do you find more interesting? I'd love to hear your comments down below. Guys, I really hope you enjoyed the video. Make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't done already. Give the video a thumbs up. And until next time, I'll catch you later. And I'll see you then.